Let me take you through a few simple existential tests for how there's an experiential relevance in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. The first thing I want to say to you is, his is the most accurate description of your heart and mine. He doesn't just go on to tell you and me that we are immoral. It is not that we are immoral, but that what separates us from God, the moral life alone cannot bring. It is not that we are immoral. But that which separates us from God, the moral life alone, you cannot pull yourself up by your own ethical bootstraps. That's the point. It takes something of that gap between the best that you can be and do to what it is your life is ultimately intended to be. Now, I want to give you an underlying idea of why so many questions in life become difficult to answer whether it's the problem of evil or the problem of good, they're all what I call second-level questions. They are symptomatic issues. The most fundamental question that has to be answered before any one of these others are answered is this. What is life's purpose? What is it about your life and mine anyway? Why are we here? When I was asked to endorse a particular book uh, by an author in England, and today I was interacting with the publisher on that, and I said I didn't like one particular line that was stated about the problem of evil and uh, that God was responsible and so on and so forth. I said, you know, it's like saying Henry Ford is responsible for somebody who drove DUI and met with an accident. An ultimate cause and an instrumental cause are two different things. Now, How do you know that there was something wrong with the way the person drove? Because that's not what you're supposed to be doing in a car. The purpose is established or what is intended for a driver and a motor car. And when you violate those purposes, even a car can be used as a weapon because the, the, weapon, the, the weapon that you choose it to be at that point is really not what the motor car was intended to be in the first place. And so I find it amazing that an average human being, when asked the question, what do you think life's purpose is all about? They're stymied. And what I want to say to you is if you do not start from the sacredness of life, everything becomes desacralized. We hear so much about freedom and liberty and human rights. When I stop and ask the person, do you also feel a person has a right to be human? They stopped. What is the base of human rights? If you don't even have the right to be a human. What is the base of existence? If you do not define essence. Who you are. Essentially. And what the Bible says about the deviant heart. And the resistant heart. Is that a heart that chooses to go its own way. And not God's. Do you know I had an economist tell me. At a conference. He said this entire global economic crisis would never have taken place if simple Christian principles had been applied right from the beginning. You can't live on borrowed money without the ability to ultimately even pay it back. You can't live beyond your means. There is a certain amount that is given. And if you go on a spending binge for that which you do not have, you will end up in bankruptcy. And I think it is Scott Peck in his book, No Easy Road. He says, I have so many people trying to explain to me why there is the possibility of evil. He said, I never had anyone explain to me why there's the possibility of good. There's the sovereignty of good. There's a goodness to essence that God intended for us to have. Now, for most of us, it takes sort of that hit in the solar plexus, that sudden jab in the, in the sternum right here. We are suddenly awakened to the darkness of human capacity. It is not your garden variety evil that oftentimes catches us by surprise. It is the heinous, unexplainable extremes to which human beings can go. Unbelievable extreme. I awakened to that when I was speaking in Poland in the 80s. Actually, I have to say there was a rude shock when I was just in my 20s 
in the, in, the, in the 1970s when I was living in Toronto at that time and went to speak in Vietnam. And what I saw there sometimes on the side of the road, or what I saw of human atrocity in this horrific thing called war, all that had gone on and all that was going on. I was a youngster and I thought to myself, my goodness, this is what we're doing to each other. There were some hospitals in, in, in Vietnam where uh, there were two to a bed unless your body was covered with burns. So if you had broken limbs, two men sharing a bed because the beds were so full. And only if you were, had bad burns in your body could you have your own bed because you just could not make contact with the possibility of infection with these sores and these cuts and burns and so on. But in the 1980s, when I was speaking in Poland for the first time and was taken to visit the death camp of Auschwitz, I'd been to concentration camps before, but I'd never been to a death camp. And when I walked through the halls of Auschwitz and walked out of there, I think something happened within my own heart when I looked at all that had transpired there, because at Auschwitz, they were eliminating them at the rate of 12,000 every day. 12,000 every day. So if you've got a thousand people sitting here tonight, 12 times this volume were sent into the gas ovens in Auschwitz every day. And I saw the sign outside the gas ovens written by Adolf Hitler. I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. Raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. And what I saw there when I walked out of it, nobody says anything. I saw some young teenagers sitting outside just at the steps, wiping the tears as they were running down their face. And I saw at that time the horrific ends to which the human heart can go. And I want to ask you, what do we call that? What do we call that? But you know, we don't need to get that far. What brought conviction to a young man's life with all of his handsomeness and all of his success? To bring that sense in his heart that something was not right with the way he was living. How did he know that unless there was an ought? Unless there was a purpose. Unless life was sacred. It was Blaise Pascal, the French existential writer, who said this. What a chimera then is man. What a novelty. What a monster. What a chaos. What a subject of contradiction. What a prodigy. A judge of all things, a feeble worm of the earth. Depository of truth, cloaca of uncertainty and error. The glory and the shame of the universe. Pascal was the father to the modern computer. If you go to Paris today, I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Jesus and Oscar Wilde. I call that sense and sensuality. And the third character I had was Blaise Pascal. And the reason I picked Blaise Pascal in that conversation with Oscar, imaginary conversation with Jesus and Oscar Wilde, taking the words right out of Wilde's own biography and words right out of Pascal's own biographical journey, in that very church where Pascal's jacket hangs, where you see a piece of paper pinned to the inside lapel of his jacket, he describes his entire encounter and conversion to Jesus Christ. And he said it could be described in only one word, fire. The blazing reality of what Christ did for him, and he died so young. In that church, Oscar Wilde's funeral was held. And those who attended said the amazing thing about a hedonist funeral was that there was no music in it. And the size of the gravestone that I visited for a while, huge phoenix made out of stone. And a verse selected by Oscar Wilde himself, a verse from the book of Job. Why did a hedonist go to the book of Job to find his epitaph? Because he found out his life of evil had shattered him. And it was almost biographical to read the book, The Picture of Dorian Gray. You see what happened to him. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this to you. Have you ever taken a good look at your own heart and ask yourself the question, who best has described what your heart is like? Is Jesus Christ himself who says to us, to you and to me, give me your heart and says to us in his word, the heart is desperately wicked and evil above all things. And yet, to a man who had gone so wrong, whom he had forgiven, because he was willing to repent, Jesus described him as a man after his own heart. 
wickedness of the human heart.